Chapter 34. The Calm Before the Storm. Chapter Tex. Chapter 34. The Calm Before the Storm. Khan knew the exact moment his sweet evening had turned unsavory. He should have seen it coming he had taken a nasty habit of leaving his stuff all around the apartment, convinced the droids would pick up after him. Giving the crusty cloak on you was holding with a disgusted pout, he should have taken into account their maintenance schedule, before discarding his revan attire carelessly in the refresher. I tripped on it this morning she said, her tone way too even to be honest. Priff. He really should learn to put his things away, especially if they were covered in shreds of evidence of his crimes. He had come home quite late from another little hunting party with Mo, and he had some stupid seminar on having a positive mindset at work that he absolutely had to attend, so he barely had the time to shower. Change and give a kiss to Anya before he had to be gone for the KDY offices. I'm sorry, I'll make sure to dispose of it properly he started. Anya shot him a rather mean look and pinched her lips, rather offended by his statement. The bloody cloak is not the issue here. She rose and let it fall on the ground with a dry noise that made him wince. It's the second time this month you bring clear evidence of gruesome murders at home, and you've been out with Maul nearly three times a week these days. Anger stiffened his spine, self-righteous, childish anger he crushed without thinking twice about it. He still felt rather petty though. I thought you were the one that absolutely wanted Maul on our side. She raised a brow but didn't rise to his bait. Instead, she walked up to him, put a hand on his shoulder, and gave him a concerned gaze she knew would make him bend. Are you losing control? Shane crept up around his lungs, wet and dewy, and he averted his eyes. No he lied. I'm just helping Maul deal with some gangsters no one will miss. Distantly, he heard the dark side laugh, and had to repress another spike of anger. He could feel it, pulsating in his veins, wrapped around his nerves, ready to break free at his smallest show of weakness. It felt ironic, and more than a little infuriating really, that just when they finally both were over the whole fat debacle, Khan's control on his powers started to fray. They had been doing so much better, and he was trying to communicate to implement Cassus's advice, and they had spent criffing hours speaking about their precious emotions, and how Anya's decisions the night of the kidnapping, had rattled him, and how Khan's rejection had hurt her, and it had been horrendous, and now the Force decided to rebel against his plans. It felt like a betrayal, even if logically speaking he knew how both situations were related. He had been distraught, to put it lightly, for an extended time. If at the time he hadn't particularly cared, obsessed with his troubles with Anya and the idea of making everything perfect again, it had still impacted his control. Cassus had said something about how he idealized feminine figures, and had extremely high standards for himself. Apparently, he subconsciously loathed deviating from the immaculate vision he had created, and tended to react strongly to perceived failure. The therapist hadn't been wrong, but his words had stung, and he had warned him. If he wanted to avoid coming off as rigid and hurting himself uselessly, he needed to learn how to tolerate imperfection. As it turned out, leaving room in their relationship for small fights and moodiness and deviations from what he had idealized their relationship to be had done wonders on their day-to-day -day lives. It also, as all changes tended to, required a lot of work. Khan still sort of hated it, and he hated even more that in those situations where Anya was not looking at him with enamored eyes, and he wanted to lash out verbally in retaliation, he could feel how true Cassus's statements were. He had lost his point, hadn't he? The darkness slithered, whispering promises in his ears, climbing around his neck from the remnants of his anger, and he straightened. Working on his relationship had been a tough but rewarding journey, but it had been work, and it had been nasty, and with his attention on it, keeping a good hold on the dark side, had been challenging to say the least. That had been his point. What's really going on? Anya asked, visibly unimpressed. Khan swallowed harshly, fighting his initial wish to brush her off. It's getting tougher to hide. She looked up sharply, her annoyance forgotten, and he felt her brush against the bond, making his own presence flare. Stop he asked. It makes it worse. Anya's force signature retreated with a small feeling of loss and emptiness he knew would have been way worse, if they had let the bond expand fully. Is it Coruscant? He shrugged. It was already there on a lesser scale on Towervin. I've been on battlefields for decades, using the dark side constantly. Pretending is tiring, Coruscant just makes it harder. Killing she started, her expression calculating, does it help you? No he confessed, his jaw clenching against his will. Yes. Maybe it does. The adrenaline does, always had. She sat on the sofa and for a moment Khan was convinced she would stop everything. After all, who would stay with the murder? A man that had just confessed he was barely able to manage to look normal. A man that killed when he felt bored with his comfortable life. A monster. Anya sighed, patted the spot next to her, and leaned against his flank when he sat down. Is there a way for you to stop hiding, even for a moment? Would it help? She asked softly. Something warm spread in his chest, chasing the shame, and he found himself nodding. I think it would but dot. Anya raised a brow. But. The dark side nexus. It's the only place where I won't be felt. She laced their fingers together, her skin soft against his, and pressed. 
Then let's do it she said before giving a vaguely admonishing look. And no more bloody cloak in the refresher. Khan pressed back, a small smile stretching his lips, and felt his silent promise echo faintly in the force, while the dark side shivered in amusement around his shoulders. Behind the window of the building facing one officer Finn's office, the shadow narrowed his eyes. He hadn't known that the geriatric fossil that had pitifully tried to stop him on Naboo, knew the calf-loving weakling that was working on his last hunts. One of his men's plant in the police force had revealed the info during an otherwise bland report he had already forgotten everything about, and Wall had laughed so hard the cop had pissed his pants in sheer terror. Once the pitiful man was gone and his hilarity had died, Maul had dismissed his underlings with vague threats to slit their throat with his bare teeth if they didn't increase profits by at least 5% before the end of the month, and decided he was going to investigate the surprising alliance. One of Coruscant's main advantages for shady individuals, namely, him, was the amount of construction work taking place at any hours of the day and night, coupled with the unexpected finances shifts most people endured there. It meant that about half of the buildings had at least a new floor being built or destroyed or remodeled, and that a good chunk of the construction sites was abandoned, sometimes for weeks, months, or even years at a time. Locations near the police station weren't particularly coveted, for obvious reasons, and getting access to the perfect place to observe his foes in peace had been easy enough. The windows had been covered with the usual material used to hide the mess inside, the flat emptied, the kitchen torn apart, and the walls demolished in at least two locations, covering the ground in little pebbles and sandy residuals. The workers had obviously stopped right after that step, not even bothering to clean the dirty flooring, and from what he knew the place had been like this for about three months, and would not be touched again for a significant amount of time. He had entered through a hole left open in the refresher, and had dragged a seat in front of the window with the best angle, where he now sat, a cup of green tea in his right hand, a little observation device in his left. It was barely more than a trinket, something he had stolen from an especially rude Rodian who was trying to spy on him a couple of days ago, probably to have a look at what lay beneath the heavy cloak he was usually wearing. It was shiny, and it had caught his eyes in between the moment he had disemboweled the Rodian, and the inevitable dive in his pockets to check for recording devices, and destroy any sort of evidence he might have gathered. The green tea was a blend the GD fossils seemed to indulge in way too often, his scent had caught his nose the last time he had endeavored to check on his enemy, and it was pleasant enough that he had decided to try it. It wasn't bad, but it lacked some spice, and it would have been better with a dash of whiskey. Mull had urges, he knew, cravings for blood, for war, for action. He knew he couldn't indulge, not all the time, not if he wanted to avoid the master's attention, but Maul was getting bored. The beast in his mind growled, intrigued at his foul mood, and Maul shut it up with a snow. Good things took patience, the master had said so when he had spoken of their coming rule, of the end of the GD, and even if the master was a lying traitor, the words had rung true then and still did now. Good things took patience, Khan had said so when he had failed the stupid control exercise he had him do the last time they had trained, and him Maul thought he could trust. He narrowed his eyes again, taking a sip of tea, while he watched the GD discuss with the officer. He looked agitated, for a stoic monk. His face was tense, his eyes thunderous. Mull had a feeling it was his fault, and his mood lightened somewhat, seeing the GD see then barely concealed anger, before he dismissed it all out in the force. For a second, the very air tasted a tad like ozone, the force tainted by the dark emotion, and Mull relished in it a thousand times more than in the taste of the tea. The cop had told him the case they were building against him would be dismissed as gang infighting most probably, and giving the officer's sad pout, he had just delivered the news. Mul smiled, a tad feral, and his eyes glinted under his hood. He had found their prowl through the coarse canty underground scene quite amusing, overall, and it had been a good test. He officially became the Black Sun leader quite recently, and was satisfied to know he had a steady grip on his underlings' tongues. His few trips toward Mantel had been fruitful, it seemed, not that he was giving them much of a chodot. His calm chimed, cutting his internal monologue. What? He answered moodily. The huts again, my lord. They attacked our latest shipment, one of his Falin lieutenants replied, his fear barely noticeable. Preffing huts. Mole rose abruptly, nostrils flaring. Are all ships lost? No, just one cargo, but you said the Falin, a young impatient thing called Mod started. Mole cut him short. I know what I said. Tell them to salvage what they can and proceed, we do not have enough support nearby to retaliate. He hung up after hearing the pitiful squeak Maj produced in response, unwilling to prolong the discussion. The huts were starting to become a constant source of annoyance. They hadn't reacted well to the Pike's core scanty capitulation, smelling how quick this could turn against them, and were since testing the waters. They attacked ships, crashed business deals, and measured how strongly Mole reacted. He hadn't graced them yet with an official statement of his stance on the matter, and he knew his silence upset them even more. It made them feel insignificant, and they hated it. The things took patience. He would bid his time, gather his forces and plan the most humiliating defeat the huts had ever known. He would crush them, bleed them dry. He would destroy them. He would destroy them. 
The Jedi turned his way, eyes glinting curiously, and Maul chained back the beast, ashamed of his lack of discipline. He should not have felt him, even from this close. Maul was better than that, this was sheer weakness. He finished the tea as the Jedi turned back to his conversation, watching the careful bend of his neck, the tension in his back. The fossil hadn't forgotten what he had sensed, he would be on guard until his return to his nauseating temple. Maul had nothing more to gain by staying there. Plus he had a revenge to plan. Yandaku took a shallow breath of fresh air, enjoying the crisp serenian morning, and sipped his tea quietly, observing a couple of birds trying to snatch the same worm from the lush grass flowing under the bright sun. The force felt at peace in that very moment, its current stretching placidly around and inside of him, quieting the coiled darkness and snaring his entrails. There was none of the hidden sharpness it carried on Coruscant, just bright soft waves of power. It felt amazing, as it had the first time he had set foot on Serena. As it usually did, the beauty of it questioned his intentions to deprave it for the entire galaxy in the near future. As it usually did, a shred of guilt burned in his stomach, easy to dismiss in the agreeable settings he found himself with. A little chime from his datapad broke the magic and got him friend. He looked at the notification, then at the message itself, and let a sad smile stretch his lips. Fod's report. Anya had been doing better, no new threat had been identified, and she had finally started to lighten her workload, after the frenzy of those last couple of months. Good, all good. Master? You required my presence a voice behind him said. Naku turned, his face now severe, and gestured towards his apprentice. Rise. The Sage had been recalled to his side after the death of Darth Maul, but she had too much use to be stuck by his side, and he knew he had been neglecting her training. Being blessed with the obligation to be on Sereno for a full month for the High Serenian Council's annual review, and the plethora of mandatory meetings that came with it, meant he could remedy to his fault, and he had taken full advantage of it. She had been growing, enough to sneak up on him, it seemed. Maybe he was growing old. I have a lunch appointment and a meeting this afternoon. We'll train this evening. In the meantime, I have a small task for you. A BC-714 should have landed in Karania a few minutes ago. I want you to extract as much information as you can from that spaceship. Data pads, cards, sticks, even the ship itself he told her, seeing her eyes widen in surprise. The banker? She asked, her tone arrogant, dismissive. Duka raised a brow in a warning, and watched her face lose its expressiveness when she sculled her features properly. Of course, master, it will be done. Good. Do not disappoint me, he replied sternly. Venter snotted and left without another word, understanding her dismissal. She had been a welcome guest at the Citadel, and a great help in avoiding the disastrous behaviors he had indulged in much too frivolously on Coruscant. Having an apprentice kept you on your toes, made you want to preserve this perfect idealized picture they had of you. He would have never recovered from the shame of having Venter seeing him passed out drunk on his desk at noon, the very thought made him shiver. He headed back in after a last look at the birds, unable to tell who finally got the worm, and marched briskly towards his quarters, intent on getting at least some work done before his business lunch with Sandhill. The Mewing had been awfully evasive since he had withdrawn the banking clan's support to his master's project, and both Palpatine and Dooku himself were interested in knowing what exactly was happening with the banker. Of course, considering his master's peculiar brand of punishment shall he fail, the Count had decided not to rely too much on San Hill's cooperation, and send Ventress as a backup solution, shall his approach fail. He sat down at his desk and unlocked his datapad, then opened the agenda and related files for the afternoon meetings. He started reading what looked like the most dreadful report on naval security he had ever set his eyes on, and sighed deeply when he realized how long the document was. At some point, he was going to have to tell Minfair to edit, nobody had time to read through this amount of dull and uninteresting information. Khan. Banya let out a gasp, her entire body shuddering when she came violently, the world collapsing for a few seconds as her mind shut down from bliss. He kissed her thigh, affectionate, then dragged himself next to her. She rolled on his chest, pretending not to notice how sweaty they both were, and kissed his jaw before she met his eyes. He looked extremely pleased with himself, which she expected, and she had to use all of her willpower not to melt against him. I have a meeting in half an hour. He groaned, pretending he hadn't known that already when he decided it was the perfect moment to spend quality time in bed together. Not that she was mad at him, they had both been behaving like horny teenagers the last couple of weeks, and most of it was of her own initiative. Sighing softly, she kissed him and tore herself from the comfortable position, stumbling towards the refresher to try not to look like she had just had fantastic sex on the High Serenian Council meeting, she would be attending way too soon. The quick shower got rid of the various fluids she was covered with, and she spent some time taming her hair before putting on a rather demure outfit. Judging her appearance for a few seconds, she decided it was going to be good enough and ran towards the library. Right on time. Today's topics weren't particularly entertaining to her. 
They were reviewing budgets and current status on internal projects to better Sereno, and while she liked to see that they were making progress, the status of the plasma bridge that would one day connect Safia to Varan wasn't exactly her area of expertise which meant she mostly had to pretend to listen, something she was becoming an expert in after spending much of her time these days sitting in boring senator-senate-related meetings. It gave her time to proceed and reflect on what happened in her life, which she was pretty grateful for these days. She was still trying to forgive herself for being a straight-up asshole to Khan for nearly a month, and leaving her uncle Wallow in self-destructive thoughts in the meantime, and she honestly wasn't sure she would be able to. Anya didn't like who she was when she was scared, and she hated herself for not having been able to put the fear behind her, when the danger had passed. Still, if she looked at it rationally, the distance had established much needed boundaries between her and her uncle, lines he now knew he could not cross without consequences, and her fight with Khan had led to a couple of instructive discussions on their relationship they would not have had without it. It was challenging to expose herself that much without any guarantee her words would be well received, and she could tell she wasn't the only one struggling. It felt very liberating though, which was probably why Khan kept going to his therapy sessions, and she knew it made their relationship, if not stronger, then at least more stable. Khan had been right about her stance on intimacy, she did think that she owed him sex, or at least a normal romantic experience, and had regularly forced herself into situations that made her uncomfortable to do so. Talking more openly about the topic had made her realize she also used intimacy as a way to fix things between them, a defense she had developed because years ago, it had been her only way to save herself from Connor's punishments. Anya shivered behind her datapad. If he hadn't stopped her that night, if he had taken what she offered him, she knew she would have resented him. When the pain had receded and she had regained her wits, she had realized how close she had come to ruin their relationship, because she would have never been able to forgive him for falling into her cruel trap. Khan, on the other hand, tended to center his entire world on her, and unconsciously put a lot of pressure on both of them to be perfect and perform, trying to fix his previous mistakes with Pat, by having the healthiest relationship and appearance with Anya, sometimes neglecting both of their needs in the process. He was intense, which was both a blessing and a curse, and they had found out rather recently that their constant interaction through the bond tended to amplify his darker traits, which did not help the matter at all. After discussing their wants, needs, and issues for a couple of highly uncomfortable hours, they had both decided to start controlling the bond a little bit more, and to cut themselves some slack. Neither of them needed to be perfect all the time for their relationship to work, and maybe that would lead to fights, maybe even big fights sometimes, and that was fine, as long as they didn't attack each other, and knew how to recognize when things got too far. At least, Khan's therapist had said so when presented with a widely edited tale of their latest relationship troubles. They had two small fights so far, one on that chatty racing evening where Khan had been largely too talkative with Qui-Gon for Anya's taste, and Anya a bit too talkative with the journalists for Khan's taste, and a second one because of Mole. Anya liked Mole. She had been the one fighting for his life, and she found his character genuinely interesting, but the goal had been to offer him some sort of redemption arc, not to let him drag Khan down with him. She had been particularly disgusted when she had gone to the refresher the morning after one of his little outings, and had tripped on a blood-stained cloak that reeked of death and violence. He had denied losing control that night and justified the ruthless murders by saying they were gangsters, and no one would miss them. Needless to say, she had been unimpressed by his explanation. After pressing him a bit more, he had finally admitted that he sort of missed the adrenaline that came with his old life, and that acting normal all day at work sparked his violent instincts. It had already been the case on a lesser level on Towervin, and he had eaten a Sith Lord and committed various murders, including Jawas, the Chani guards on Sojourn and Karner's dad, but according to him being on Coruscant with the constant stimulation of their bond, and having to hide his powers all the time made him even more on edge. And going on murder sprees on bad guys with Maul helped him cope. Anya didn't particularly love the idea, she found it risky at best, but well, her body count was probably higher than his, as she started counting from the day they returned, even if most of it was done in self-defense, so she felt she had no room to talk. She had asked if there was a way for him to stop hiding his powers even for a little while, and if such a break would do him good, and he said yes. The dark side nexus would hide him well, they just needed to pick a convenient one. The gala was in a little bit more than a week now, and after that, the senate would still be on break for a month, which left them with sufficient time to go on holiday. She would have offered Serena, but frankly, she still wasn't on very warm terms with her uncle, and she wanted to be away from any media presence and social obligations. After picking their location and sending Khan's boss and whole mail to request some days off, Khan had stood awkwardly, hesitant, then asked if she would like to meet his mother. Her heart had exploded, and it had made the idea of spending part of her precious free time on the Stafer of all places a lot sweeter. It was not, by far, their first choice, but it seemed too convenient to dismiss. 
Her uncle kept a bastion in John at the time, and she suspected he went there instead of Sereno, when he wanted to study the dark side. Corbin and the other Sith worlds were too risky. After all, Sidious would be on break too, and if his preference for Biss was well known to the both of them, they couldn't risk an encounter. Sojourn was gone, Dagaba was a disgusting swamp, and the other dark side nexus they knew were either unattractive or unpractical. Masafer, being a volcanic planet, was the perfect place to practice with his force fire. He owned it, and he knew it extremely well. So, vacationing on Mistafer then Tatooine it was. At least it had the merit of being exotic. Gorm turned towards her holo. He had been tasked with leading the meeting that afternoon, and so far she couldn't say she had been spectacularly impressed. Countess Anya, will you be present for the inauguration? Oh, right, that damned bridge again. She tried to remember when they had scheduled it, failed, and decided for a non-committing answer. It will depend on my schedule at the time, but I will if I can. Gorm nodded. Understood. Councillor Minfarid, your report is our next item. Yes, Councillor Gorham Minfarid replied, positively beaming. As I stated in our introductory meeting, Project Kefir is advancing remarkably well. The initiative decreased both the traffic-related accidents and the overall crime rate, and had led to the creation of 15 additional positions in the Space Traffic Control Bureau. The integration of the Republic Cardin class space station hasn't been as seamless, but I can now safely say that our defenses are fully operational and coordinated. He kept on going for a while, and Anya zoned out again, listening only marginally to Councillor Minfair's rather boring report. She felt honored that Khan wanted her to meet Shmai, but it also terrified her, a bit. What if the woman didn't like her? She had never been introduced to anyone's parents, Kref Khan was her first boyfriend. And said parent wasn't even aware that she was, and it should make it better, simpler, but it made it harder in a way, because Shmai wouldn't get how meaningful this soul was for Khan. What if she didn't like her? Okay, she was terrified, a lot. Still, it meant something. Khan didn't have to do this, Shmai wouldn't care if he didn't, obviously, and he still wanted to go through it, because she mattered to him, because he wanted to share a new piece of him with her, just as she had shared a piece of her with him when they went to Sereno. How was she going to dress? The safer didn't matter too much, they were going alone, so she had just planned some basic training outfits that would do well in a warm environment, but Tatooine. She didn't want to appear as weird or standoffish to Shmai, and she didn't know anything about Tatooine's fashion. Like colors. Maybe. She was tempted to do a quick holonet search, Minfarid was still talking, and at this point, no one was listening anymore, but she didn't want to be caught, it would have to wait. Do we have the numbers and repartition of cases handled by the Cardin class space station? She asked once it seemed obvious the counselor had stopped talking for that exact reason. Minfarid smiled, pleased to see that at least someone was following, and Anya felt a tiny wave of guilt wash over her, probably dismissed in the force. What was her uncle saying again? The force wasn't a garbage bin to dump your emotion into when they were inconvenient. Well, true or not, it still worked quite well for small things like that. They have submitted a report earlier this month, apparently they deal mostly with outer rim pirates and some spice traffic outside of regular ID issues, though not in particularly high numbers. If you look at the table here, you can see our numbers against theirs when Ferret replied. Anya frowned when she took a closer look. Less traffic, but we have a relatively high number of near orbit piracy, do we know why? Mining ships, they are very often targeted when coming to Sereno to deliver the ores, and are particularly vulnerable near orbit, because they are extremely slow to recalibrate their shielding to enter Atmo. Anya hummed approvingly, thoughts dancing on her mind on potential solutions, and her uncle, apparently as unhappy with those results as she was, barged in. Please look into this matter further, Councilor Minfarid. I want to know if it is possible to upgrade the shielding system. If it is send me an estimation of the cost associated with it. If not, we will have to look into replacing the fleet progressively. Our mining crew should not have to face piracy to such extents. I will, Count Dooku. He wrapped up his report relatively quickly after that, and she guessed pointing out the flaw in their current fleet had been one of his goals. Naremi went next with a comprehensive review on the main planetary builds that passed last year, and their short-term effects, then went on with those being passed this year. Some of them were direct response to laws Anya had voted on the Senate, so she was able to provide some inputs on galactic perceptions and general updates regarding coming bills related to recently voted ones, making the meeting somewhat interesting to her. The taxation of free trade zones and Countess Anya's operation on Naboo have weakened our standing with the Commerce Guilds, although we still have the full support of the banking clans, Naremi said with a tiny smirk, her tone edging on acidic. Orjin frowned, disapproval etched on his face. It got us the mining contract on Naboo, though. Correct, Councillor Borjan Anya said with a placating fake smile, and I cannot disclose the official numbers yet, but the taxation of free trade zones, coupled with the past year's effort to cut costs on the Senate's various organs, will lower significantly the Republic taxes. Naremi huffed, her face twisted in contempt. That would be a first. The taxes have been increasing for more than a decade now. 
This was exactly why Anya had been so bent on passing reforms cutting costs, and had advocated strongly for more intelligent and cost-effective ways of using the taxes. Everybody loved people who made them pay less. It came as a surprise to most senators involved too, but the reorganization of the subchambers made a stark difference in spending, and the commerce guilds finally having to pay significant fees for their systemic abuse of the laws got us the funds needed to cut back taxes. Remy pinched her lips, annoyed that her jab hadn't landed properly, and looked like she had bitten in a sour lemon when Duku congratulated Anya for her work on the Senate. She resumed her presentation after schooling her features back to amicable neutrality, detailing their draft yearly legislative plan and amending it according to their various inputs. The meeting concluded after that talk, just as the sun was starting to set on Coruscant. They would meet again another time for a wrap-up on everything discussed the following morning, then the heavy load of High Serenian Council's meetings would finally be behind her, leaving her some time to attend the Sir lunches. Review the Galactic Flight Academy reports for the current school year, and attend various committee sessions that were organized to prepare for the coming Senate year. The workload had eased up quite a bit since she had spent a ton of extra hours working during her month-long crisis, but since she did plan on escaping from work for at least two weeks, she wanted to get the maximum of things done beforehand, to be able to enjoy her holidays in peace. And now, she could research what she was going to wear on Tatooine. The hole on that didn't offer her much, unfortunately, desert planets usually called for long and white outer clothes, and light but resistant materials, but she hadn't seen anything specific in terms of current fashion. Most sources just recommended not to visit the planet, and warned against its particularly arid climate. Sure, nothing new there. It didn't tell her what to wear to make a good first impression on her sort of future mother-in-law. Annoyed, she went down to Khan's workshop, where he was working on what he had explained was a cloaking mechanism for his ship that would allow them to slip right past course scanty controls. She found the idea charming, even though she had an intuition his first intention hadn't been to use it for a romantic escapade in the outer rim. When she entered Khan was sweating, his hair was damp and stuck on his forehead. He was obviously focused on his task and was covered in dark grease and oils. How on the force was he still so hot? She waited until he finished to interrupt him, unwilling to mess up his work, and her heart fluttered when he looked up and smiled at her, blue eyes glinting with gold and silver specks in the artificial lights. I was going to come up after I finish this, what is up? Are you still okay with eating out? She asked, ridiculously flustered and somewhat too nervous to ask her true question. He frowned, looking vaguely confused. They had discussed it not five hours ago, and her attitude didn't match her words, but without the constant feedback of the bond, he struggled with identifying her true feelings. Sure, do we have a reservation? Anya just smirked petty arrogance dancing round her. As if any reputable place on Coruscant would turn them away. He rolled his eyes in response. I see. She refrained from biting the inside of her cheek, her nervosity rising again when she decided to move forward with her real interrogation. Actually I didn't come just for that. I don't know if I have any clothes for Tatooine, what would you recommend? A small smile stretched his lips, gentle and touched, and something vibrant bloomed in her chest at the sight. Do you want to know what to wear on Tatooine, or what I think my mother would like? Anya fidgeted under his knowing gaze and felt herself blush stupidly. It was maddening how quickly he could undo the carefully crafted layers of polite aloofness and intriguing mystery she usually surrounded herself with, but it wasn't completely unpleasant. Both. He huffed in amusement and put down his tools, wiping his dirty hands on an equally dirty towel on his bench, then smeared some grease on his forehead when he tried to arrange his hair. Anya watched him, quite entertained, and wondered how often the cleaning droids were grumbling after him for turning the penthouse into a war zone. Khan was definitely M7's worst nightmare, though she supposed the thorough checkups and frequent oil bath he spoiled the droids with helped a lot with his standing among the penthouse's mechanical aids. I don't think she is going to care about what you wear here assured her, but if we don't want to get too noticed I would recommend something plain and comfortable, and a dark travel cloak I suppose. Anya nodded, doing a mental inventory of her dressing to see if she had anything that matched his description. Do you think she is still working for Wada? She shook Khan replied flatly. She swallowed, feeling her throat tighten uncomfortably. Do you think she'll like me? He closed his eyes, sighing, and she worried for a moment that she had annoyed him with her concerns. She peered discreetly at his presence, and he felt a tad sad in the force, shadowed by conflicting feelings. Had she triggered something? I'm not even sure she likes me in this life, she certainly didn't trust me the last time I saw her. I just saw Khan's side again, rubbing his nose and smearing even more grease on his face, but Anya didn't have the heart to laugh at him anymore. I just hope it all works out. She reached out through their connection when she put her clean hand on his dirty shoulder, uncaring, and pressed lightly, trying to convey support. I'm sure it will. A whisper echoed in the force, creating ripples like a stone thrown into quiet water, and she could hear the silent question traveling through the strings and knots connecting the universe. The answer reached her, a delicate brush against her mind, comforting and warm, and she felt Khan relax under her palm when he heard it through her. 
I'll pack with you if you want he finally said, unwilling to linger on the topic of his relationship with his unknowing mother. She smiled and bent down, kissing a relatively clean spot on his dirty cheek. Perfect, I'll tell Anne Dai to send me a first selection. Khan raised a brow, clearly unconvinced. I wouldn't trust her with anything plain and comfortable. Anya laughed. He wasn't wrong, but she was sure she worded it in an intriguing way and Dai would jump on the occasion to provide her the best undercover clothes like a rabbit in Uber. She left him to finish his work and went back to her desk in the library to reply to some hollow mails and approve her planning with Fod before getting ready to go out. Khan usually ate at home if he wasn't seeing Jared or Mol, but they had decided to try and diversify their couple activities and she had suggested dinner dates. She was at that point familiar with a ton of restaurants on Coruscant and they both shared a common love for food. It was relaxing not to have to cook sometimes, which was a plus, and it also broke a bit their routine, which was something Jared had suggested. Anya wasn't sure she liked their relationship being discussed with the captain on her ship, his father worked in a close position to her uncle and herself, but it was good for Khan to have friends, and she supposed it was part of it. She personally wouldn't discuss anything specific with Qui-Gon, but she had gone to and died to get some scandalous lingerie to win her man back, which had included some brief exchange on the precise context. She concluded it was fair game. Jared was, anyway, surprisingly knowledgeable on relationships, and had in general good ideas. And I had been well, a lot more dramatic. She was now fully equipped with a plethora of both enticing ensembles and accessories, including some she couldn't even look at without blushing furiously, and she had lent her a rather old flimsy book that had been distributed to all of her sorority sisters at Karani's university, filled with what And I had called trade secrets. Maybe And I was becoming her friend, too. Well, if not she was under a strict confidentiality agreement anyway. In any case, she was looking forward to dining out with her boyfriend. The nights were warm these days, and she had selected a trendy rooftop restaurant that had opened recently in the banking district. Lexi Dio had warmly recommended it when she had tried to question her subtly on her romance with Prince Adjard, and she had dined there a couple of times since with Lexi herself, but also Fang and Antilles. The food was really good, and the tables were arranged in a way that maximized privacy, which allowed for discreet conversations and an overall enjoyable experience even as a public figure. She felt him ask for entrance, and realized she had been staring at a reflection with her makeup brush in hand for at least three embarrassing minutes. She replied in the same manner, feeling her skin tingle as his familiar presence grew closer, and tried to think of a good outfit to wear while finishing her makeup. It was sour, sometimes, to notice how sweet her life was these days. It made her despise who she had been, naive, dumb, eager to brush over anything untoward to revel in blissful ignorance. It made her scared, because in some ways she was still like that. Was she missing something? What was Palpatine plotting? Was there something coming their way, something big, something that would do all of their rather slow-moving plans? She had trouble thinking he was just sitting behind his desk all day without anything remotely nefarious in preparation, but it had been nearly a year now since Sojourn, and he hadn't made any recognizable moves. What was he doing? Anya felt her stomach churn uneasily and let out a frustrated sigh. What did it say about her that she felt panic because she was too happy? Her lifestyle was luxurious, comfortable, devoid of any of the issues the great majority of the galactic population were facing every day, she was supposed to be happy. She was living the dream, wasn't she? But it just, it disturbed her, how easy it was to let herself get lulled in a false sense of safety, when in truth, they were walking on thin ice. Palpatine already disliked her for her general political stance, and the rude interaction they had last year, Qui-Gon was too smart for his own good, and her uncle had betrayed her once and could do it again. Being involved with Maul and Sand Hill were added risks, as they were both intelligent, ruthless, and unpredictable. If even one of them ever learned the truth or got too close to it, they were screwed, and would have to delete whoever knew before they could spread it. It would be a disaster. Anya. You're spacing out, are you okay? Khan was frowning, his freshly washed long mane letting a consistent stream of water droplets on the ground. She pinched her lips, her body hesitating between being annoyed by his behavior, when they had perfectly functional towels at their disposal or turned on by the sight. She grabbed one and started drying his hair, smiling when he sat on the side of the tub to give her easier access. Just thinking. I am worried about Palpatine. Khan hummed pensively. He doesn't seem to be making too many moves these days. That's what worries me. The clone army is his now, through my uncle, but I have a hard time believing he is otherwise inactive. Her hands clenched around the towel and she struggled to keep going. We are lacking insight, and I dot. You don't want us to be surprised he cut her, his tone too neutral to be fully natural. Me neither, and I agree, it has been going a bit too well since Sojourn. He knows there is another Sith, he knows he killed Plagueis, and he should at least suspect he killed Mole. He should have done something by now, his silence is suspicious. Anya's heart stopped beating for a second, fear spreading through her veins like a cold liquid. You think he is waiting for a mistake. 
Khan shrugged, halting her effort to wrap the towel around his head, in an attempt to focus her attention on something a little less stressful. Possible, from what we know most Sith would get overconfident in the absence of competition. It might also be that he is waiting to become Chancellor to have the legal backing to execute his designs. Anya shivered and felt a shimmer of something dark and unsavory pulse in the Force. A bad impression. I don't like this. He turned towards her, his hair now contained in an elegant turban-shaped trap towel, and she could see the echo of her own frustration in his eyes. We can review Plague's files during the holidays, see if we missed anything. She nodded in assent. The Nexus might offer us some clues too. Khan smiled and hope grew in her again, quieting her concerns. It always amazed her how inspiring he was, there was just something in the way the force curled around him that spoke of greatness, of golden success, and a higher purpose. A sort of innate magnetism that polarized his interactions with the world. He was hated or adored, but very few people were indifferent to Khan. It stroked something in her, it had the first time she had seen him, in that cell on Bis where she had thought she was going to spend the rest of her days, setting a chain reaction of inexplicable emotions that had led her to want to live again. It did today, igniting passion and purpose in her soul when a moment ago she had been fearful. It brightened her mood significantly, the bad impression fading, and when around an hour later they both sat in front of each other on the candlelit table of the restaurant, chatting pleasantly and enjoying the chef's amazing cuisine, and a great bottle of wine, Palpatine wasn't even on her mind anymore. 